Hello, today I'm with Louis from Eleven Labs and we're going to be talking about adding payments to agentic workflows. Hi Louis, can you tell us a little bit about Eleven Labs and what your role is there? Sure, so Eleven Labs is an AI audio research company. I work on making our API accessible to our developers worldwide to make it easy to use so they can integrate things like speech into their applications seamlessly. Okay, and so you're demonstrating a example use case that you built for our developer community in our London office later today. Can you tell us a little bit about that uh, demonstration that you'll be showing off? Yeah, sure. So for, to prepare for the event, um, I wanted to build a really cool demo with conversational AI. So on Monday, I was looking at the agent toolkit that Stripe now provides, and I wanted to see what, ha what would happen if we connected that conversational AI product to the tools to interact with Stripe. Um, it was a really interesting demo. I put it on Twitter and I showed like a demo of um, people, someone managing a subscription workflow like refunds, subscribing to a product um, all through the dashboard. Um, so it got a pretty good reception on of, Twitter. Of someone managing your, the workflow? Or of the agent? conversational AI agent managing the workflows, yeah. Okay, and is that something you'll be showing off later today? Yeah, I'll be showing it off later today, awesome. doing a live demo. Fantastic. Yeah. Actually, so when you do live demos with, with agentic workflows, how can you be sure it's going to behave in the way that you always need or expect it to? It's a very good question. Um, sometimes on the day of the demo, as you know, um, things can go wrong. <laughs> demo gods, um, yeah. But the way that you sort of deploy these things in production is that you have very good guardrails. So you're defining a system prompt that essentially tells the agent how to do things, how to handle certain interactions and workflows. Uh, to make sure that at the end of the day, it's going to do the same thing over and over again. Um, obviously, as you all know, ChatGBT and things like that, they're all uh, idempotent systems, which means you might not get the same output with every input that's the same. Um, so you can't always control that, but you can add these guardrails at like, application level and system prompt level uh, to make sure that it kind of behaves in a way that you expect mm. um, over time kind of a brave demo to be showcasing. It is. It's one of my most nerve-wracking uh, yeah. demos to, to, to demo today. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the technical challenges that you have to take on when you're building conversational AI applications? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is probably around security. When you're dealing with things like payments and customer information, these things are extremely sensitive. Adding things like guardrails mm -hmm. um, is super crucial and making sure that a customer interacting with an agent can't just go and take someone else's customer details is critical. Um, so that's probably the most effort that you probably would want to put in into a production use case for this. Um, in terms of actually using the Stripe SDK, it's very simple, which is both really good and bad. Obviously, it enables the agent to call these different tools. Um, but as a developer, it's such so easy to use, but you have to make sure that you're implementing it with the right guardrails and the right security mechanisms to make sure that it's not going to behave mm. in unexpected ways. So what are some of the security mechanisms that you need to implement then? Sure, I think there's two things. So the first thing is like application level security. So you can imagine things like when I sign into a dashboard, um, I expect that the interaction with the agent will be constrained and confined to my specific customer account. Um, and that I can't go and talk about other people's accounts or request a refund for someone else's customer ID, if that makes sense. Um, so having that application level constraint is really important. And the second thing is probably the system prompt, making sure that the agent is behaving in a way that's acceptable to customers. Um, so having things like talk, talk as a friendly agent and not an aggressive one, you know, um, try to upsell product X and not downsell it, things like that to make it sort of uh, a viable thing to put into production. So how do you make sure your agent has access to only do certain things within a, a given account? Yeah, so with conversational AI that we deployed, um, so you'd essentially, prop, so when the, when the session starts with the agent, you'd in, initiate it with a customer ID. Yeah. And whenever the agent tries to call a tool, it, only, it can only match that customer ID that it calls on the route. Yeah. Okay, what about different actions within that customer ID? So could it accidentally, delete an account or you know, yep. uh, raise an invoice when it shouldn't have the, the access to do that? How do you ensure that? Yeah, so the agent toolkit is set up in a really neat way in that you define these guardrails at initialization. So when you're giving Stripe's secret key into this agent toolkit, you're essentially also defining which permissions it can have across the account. So you say, 
I want it to be able to read from my customer details or refund payments, but not delete the customer essentially. So it was quite a neat way of designing that specific SDK is having these permissions, le permissions defined um, at that top level. Okay. Yeah. So could you take us through some of the development workflow that you need to think about when integrating with Stripe? So in terms of conversational AI? Yeah, with conversational AI. Yeah, so with conversational AI, um, so obviously having an agent that can do these things, that mm -hmm. can call tools. Uh, so I, obviously 11 Labs conversational AI is the one that I used, um, but it works with things like AI SDK, uh, Crew AI, you can integrate it into any uh, agentic workflow. Um, but with conversational AI, you create the agent, so you define the first message and the system prompt. Uh, the system prompt acts as the guardrails or the sort of orchestrator of what actually happens in the conversation. Um, so you'd say things like, if a customer asks for a refund, first check that they haven't used all of their credits um, and then things like that, so you can essentially guardrail it. Um, with conversational AI, you can create voices, so you can sort of design your agent in a way that sounds very approachable, very human-like, um, which is really interesting to play around with. Like, I'm not sure if you've tried conversational AI uh, or Eleven Labs, but you can design these things to be very realistic, um, as if you're sort of talking to a real human, which I think is an amazing thing. Um, the third thing is you can integrate it with Twilio. So you can have things like uh, the agent callable from a phone number, so you can essentially pick up the phone and literally call an agent um, and ask it whatever questions you want about your account. Yeah. So yeah, there's a bunch of things to... Have you ever gone down a rabbit hole and sort of forgotten what you're working on and, and had like little testing the limits of what it can respond with? Yeah, I think um, when you're talking to the agent, it almost feels like a bit of a surreal experience. Yeah. Um, I think we're living in like an incredible time where these things are at that point where it's becoming good enough to actually work, right? The voices are realistic, uh, the transcriptions are very accurate, and we're working on models to essentially improve the transcription. So we have a new speech to text model coming out very soon to sort of support this. Um, and the entire conversational AI stack is sort of built on our different models we've been working on over the years. So text to speech is our core product. Um, so we use our new flash model that has 75 millisecond latency. So it's incredibly fast. Right. And obviously that latency matters a lot to the end consumer. You can imagine if you're speaking to an agent and it takes three seconds to respond, that is not the same experience as if it takes 75 milliseconds. It feels a lot more natural in terms of conversation. I love in your demo as well, how you, you, you interrupt the agent, you talk over him yep. or her or it, and it pauses to yep. listen to what you're saying before responding back. Like, I think that's a really like a uh, human way of interacting, which, which I hadn't thought about until I saw your demo. Yeah. So that's called voice activity detection. Okay. So when you're talking to the agent, we're essentially streaming your voice to our backend. Um, and we have thresholds to say, agent, stop talking at a specific threshold. Um, we're actually moving towards a transformer-based uh, voice activity detection model. So what that means is, Things like um and no and uh, like, well, no would interrupt it, but things like um would like not interrupt it. Mm -hmm. Because a lot in, in different cultures, you have to think about the way people talk, right? In places like Spain, they have a lot of filler words that might not necessarily mean that they're requesting, a, 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 requesting the agent to talk back. Um, so we have to sort of account for these different filler words, right. like um, for example. Yeah. So that's a very interesting thing we're working on. I've seen the results for it and it's looking really good. Um, it allows you to sort of not interrupt it based on a signal of voice. So it's how does yeah. the the tooling and the dependency management change when you're building these kinds of applications? It's exactly the same as traditional okay. ones. So I use Next.js. Mm -hmm. So Next.js is obviously like a backend front end library framework. Um, PMPM for installing packages, like nothing changes. You're using the same technologies as you would in uh, you know previous applications that were before these AI um, conversational solutions. Um, so it's pretty much the same, yeah. Okay, and are there any particular features of, of the kind of Stripe modularity that you found particularly useful or particularly challenging when you were integrating mm. payments? So I think Stripe has a very good separation of concerns. So you have a bunch of different, you have a lot of different API routes. Um, I think when you're talking about agentic systems, being able to tie an API route to a customer, for example, making the call itself tied to a customer would have been really useful. Obviously, it's been designed to work in the back end with you know, a sort of core service handling a bunch of customers. 
But when you're dealing with a personal interaction, being able to, to sort of constrain these API routes to specific customers um, is actually what you guys are working on. I spoke to one of your engineers yesterday. He reached out after the demo and I sort of gave him some feedback and that was one of the pieces that they're, they're working on. So there's small improvements like that that would need to you know, level up the experience for the future of agents for Stripe. Um, but in general, the obviously the Stripe SDK and the APIs are, are world-class to work with. Yeah, as a developer. That's great to hear that you tweeted your demo and the engineer actually reached out. I know. To you. I, I found that amazing. Nice. I had three engineers reach out from Stripe as soon as that demo went live. Um, gave them, gave me their phone numbers, you know, <laughs> and, and they're all the way across the other side of the world. So it's amazing that you have that sort of really good human connection when you're developing these kind of systems. So what are some of the areas of conversational AI, maybe with or maybe um, separate to payments, mm. that you're most excited about? Yeah. There are a bunch of different use cases. Um, I think at the moment we're seeing a lot of fun use cases. Like I built a Talk to Santa project uh, in December, so you could essentially talk to Santa Claus, give it your your wish list, um, and it would then send you a letter. But I think we're slowly moving towards things becoming more practical. So we're deploying it in uh, warehouse companies that need to sort of screen operators of different vehicles. Um, deploying it for customer support, for example, if you go to our documentation on Eleven Labs, you can actually interact with our documentation agent and ask it to take you to a specific page and it will do the whole redirection. It will link you to sales. Um, so a bunch of really interesting use cases coming out. We're still learning about them every day, to be honest. Like These workflows are just completely new to, to us and to all the companies we're, we're working with. So it's exciting to see this field really progress, especially over the last few months. Are there yeah. any enterprise specific use cases that you've seen popping up? Enterprise specific use cases, I think customer support is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. um, so product refunds, product returns, um, being able to manage that outside of a chat window. Because um, obviously if you've ever done a refund or a return on com uh, on any, any company, um, you usually have to interact with a chatbot. And that chatbot usually has very limited context or ability to do anything. Um, so giving them the tools to essentially do things that a normal agent would do is uh, the new paradigm that we're currently working with at the moment. Okay. And so as a conversational AI app specialist, what do you see as the future of app payment workflows? I foresee that, well, for context at Eleven Labs, for example, we deal with a lot of these kind of requests. Our customers are asking for different ways to manage their subscriptions, um, asking for sometimes refunds or payment issues. Um, so we deal with a lot of these kind of requests, and they take a lot of time to debug, mm. like in person. Like if you're dealing with these kind of requests, you have to go and look at the customer ID, figure out why they deserve a refund, and if not. Um, and then trigger the refund. And if an agent can do all these things automatically and with some guardrail, you end up automating an incredible part of customer support. Um, so that's what we're sort of working on at the moment. So that then frees up those support agents to work on other things that, that maybe can't be automated. Exactly. So you know, our support agents are working on community engagement a lot. So they're interacting with the developer community now. Um, so we're seeing a lot of these different things free up their time, which they'd rather not spend doing customer refunds. Um, so yeah, it's exciting. Okay, so where can people go to maybe see more of what you're working on? So we have a documentation website. So I manage all of our documentation, all of our SDKs and APIs. Um, so go to 11labs.io slash docs. That's where you'll see a lot of our work. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Lou. I'm really looking forward to seeing your, your presentation later, and I'll make sure I link your demo in the description of the video as well. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.